All right, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Peter, and today I'll be talking about the differences between professional and amateur esports. And uh, we're going to be doing so through the lens of win probability. So, what is win probability? Well, it's exactly the kind of thing that it sounds like it's the chance, it's the number that estimates the probability that a team will win a game. So, what we see here is uh, an image of win probability and how it changes over the course of a CSGO round. Um, we have the two sides in orange and blue. And win probability is useful for a variety of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, it can be used for, for player evaluation. There's quite a few papers, um, both in conventional sports and now also esports, that, that use this idea. It's also directly useful for sports betting. Um, you also start to see um, some of the statistical content on uh, live streams and on broadcasts because um, this content is is pretty sought after by fans and it's also useful for understanding the game itself and that's what we're going to be focusing on in in the talk today so typically win probability models are trained in a single environment and so what we mean by that is the data comes from either you know purely amateur games or purely professional games um, but in other sports, we know that there are variations in these models when they're trained in, in different environments. So to give an example, um, Branson and Davis um, created expected goals models, which are similar to win probability models. Um, and they created these models on um, women's soccer data and men's soccer data. And they found that the models um, performed quite similarly to each other if you uh, looked at these models based on like log loss or kind of like the classical metrics. But if you dug a little bit deeper, you found situations that varied significantly. So for example, they found that women tended to shoot from different positions and these positions had slightly higher shot conversion rates. So this type of study is, is missing um, in, in the esports community. And so the main goal that we're trying to address here, uh, the main question is how do these win probability models in esports differ among the various competitive levels? So let's just start by introducing the game. Um, in this study, we're concerned with Counter-Strike, which as many of you know, is a long standing, long running FPS series. And this is actually precisely why uh, we focus on, on this game. Um, it's got many, many players, a very robust um, esports community. They're players that derive a living just from playing this game. So <clears throat> with that in mind, it's very popular and very relevant, but also at the same time, it um, Counter-Strike um, has lots of public data, which many esports um, don't have. So these this public data consists of um, the game replays or the demo files is, is how they're called. And we can use these demo files to, to create these win probability models. And if you're unfamiliar with Counter-Strike, it's uh, the long story short is that it's a five versus five um, FPS game. And there's two sides, the CT, blue, and the T, which is orange. And the goal is to win a series of rounds. So let's talk about the, we define kind of like three main um, skill groups or sources of data. The first is this amateur data, which we call MM, which stands for matchmaking. And this is the default uh, matchmaking mode within the game. You load the game, you press play, and then you get matched with players um, in your region. And this is amateur because there's not really money involved. Um, there's pretty large skill gaps between players oftentimes. Um, and it's a very low stakes environment. Now, the next level up is um, what we could consider semi-pro. We call it face it because that's the service that that we uh, derive the data from. And um, on FACET, there are pro-specific matchmaking queues. And in these queues, you have uh, both professional players and well-known streamers that um, play in a closed queuing system. So they're only gonna be playing with, with people that have been invited to this system. So for, for pros, it's, it's about like 100 to 200 people in this system, both in Europe and in North America. And these are very high skilled players, but they're ultimately still playing a pickup game. So it's not like an organized play. Now, the last level is what we call pro or HLTV, which is where you derive a lot of the data from. And this is exactly what you imagine. These are professional players. They play on teams. They have 
well thought out strategies and um, typically good coordination and communication. So the data themselves are, uh, as I said earlier, the, these um, demo files or, or these game replays. And we take a batch of them from a few months in 2021. And because it's such a popular game, there's plenty of pro, semi-pro, and amateur <coughs> demos um, that we get a hold of. Um, the pro demos come from HLTV, which is a common, which is a very popular website that hosts these demo files. Um, the semi-pro come from Faceit, as I said, um, and the HLTV and Faceit demos are, are public. Now, the amateur demos um, come from a partnership with, with PureSkill, which is um, a coaching platform that allows the signed up users to track their their matchmaking you know uh, through valve um, games so in, we we have over 10,000 demo files um, we have qu quite a few games that that we're looking at here so now let's look at the prediction task um, but before we do that let's briefly just define a game state and what we call a game state here is an object that contains all the information of the game at time t this information can be things like how much time is remaining what the total HP of each side is and their equipment and so on. And the idea is we want to use this game state at time t in round r, which we call GTR here on the right. And we want to use this value to predict the outcome of round r, which we denote as yr. And we'll say that yr is equal to 1 if the CT side wins the round. So there's a lot of different ways that we could go about estimating this relationship. Typically what you see in conventional sports and in some prior uh, esports literature is we use things like boosted trees or logistic regression, neural networks. Um, but what we're particularly interested in here is um, interpreting our models and understanding what, what is driving winning um, as opposed to eking out the, the best sort of performance that, that we can get. Because if we remember the, the goal here is to understand um, aspects of the game. So for that reason, we go for a generalized additive model. Um, it, it looks, you know, on first glance, it'll look very similar to a, a linear regression. Uh, the main difference being that uh, the contribution of these features, which we denote x1, x2, and so on, um, can vary based on um, its value. And that allows us to create um, some nice plots, like these partial dependence plots, where the x-axis is the feature and the y-axis is the feature's uh, contribution. And to get the prediction, we just sum up all of the contributions. And we'll, we'll, we'll show examples of this soon. So to put it all together, we have the game state vector, which tells us all the information of the game at time t. We pass it through into our GAM, and our GAM will produce two things. It'll produce the predicted probabilities of winning the round for each side, and it'll also produce the feature attributions. So with that in mind, we can talk about um, the results. And in general, uh, the models perform quite well from environment to environment in the sense of if I train a model on professional data, I will get pretty similar performance on both the professional, semi-pro, and amateur test data sets. But like we see um, in other sports, we, uh, <clears throat> we can identify certain situations that are, that are quite different. So we'll go through a few interesting findings here. Um, the first finding has to do with the global feature importance. So globally, um, and this is not a really big surprise, things like the team's HP, how many players are alive, their equipment value is very, very um, important. Uh, they have high feature contributions. Um, this is no surprise, really. Of course, the team that has more players alive and higher HP is more likely to win. But there are some interesting um, discrepancies. So for example, if we look at the um, the helmets, um, for, and this is the number of helmets on the T side. So what's interesting here is that for both the semi-pro and pro, um, this has a much higher feature contribution than it does in the amateur environment. Um, and if we remember actually from, from the first talk, um, there's a few hypotheses that, that one could develop from here. Um, I think a pretty straightforward one is that um, helmets reduce the impact of a headshot but as we know from the first uh, talk, uh, headshots are probably more common in the pro and semi-pro, uh, particularly because they um, have much better aiming uh, and shooting skills than amateur players do. So it's interesting here that we see that the um, effect of uh, the helmets is, is much more diminished in, um, 
the amateur environment than the pro environment. Uh, the second uh, big um, observation that, that we noted was the issue of maps. And so the map is just the 3D world that they play on. So when you queue up for a game, you either join a specific map that you want to join or you know the, the queuing system will randomly assign you one. Um, but in general, you select the maps that you want to play. And so we see that in the semi-pro and amateur environments, which are pickup game environments or pug environments, there's a very heavy preference towards particular maps. So for example, we see here maps like Mirage, Dust2, and Inferno um, are very heavily favored in these uh, semi-pro and amateur environments as opposed to pro environments. So for example, um, in, the, in the pro environment, all of the maps are fairly uniform in terms of how often they're picked much different in, um, in, in semi-pro and amateur. And just for um, uh, just to show here, the, the percentage is the selection rate and uh, underneath you have the feature contribution. So positive benefits the CT, negative benefits the T side. And what's interesting here is we see that for particular maps, this benefit is, is quite stark. So for example, Inferno is um, much more T-sided in pro games than it is in amateur games. Um, and, and this also kind of confirms general um, community uh, opinions of these maps too. And so this last interesting relationship that we note is the, the issue of time. How does time affect um, the win probability? Um, we have two situations, one where the bomb is planted, another where the bomb is not planted. So when the bomb is not planted, the more time that elapses, the more likely the CT side is, is gonna win. Just like when the bomb is planted, the more time that elapses, the more likely the T side is gonna win. That's because when the bomb is planted, it'll explode after 40 seconds. And when the bomb isn't planted, the round will end after um, a little bit over hundred seconds, I believe like 115 uh, perhaps. So what's interesting is that, you know, we, we see the relationships that we would expect, but what's interesting is that the effects are much larger in matchmaking than they are, sorry, in the amateur environments than they are in the pro and the semi-pro environments. Um, and again, there's a, quite a few hypotheses that, that one could uh, postulate here. Um, generally in the semi-pro and the pro environments, these are professional players who have very um, nuanced um, <clears throat> uh, understanding of timing in the game and they have good communication. Um, and so, in, in that sort of sense, there's um, there's perhaps more uh, room to mess up in, in the amateur games than perhaps the semi-pro and pro environments. But this is definitely a relationship that uh, requires uh, more investigation. And it also um, <clears throat> begs the question as to how does communication affect um, things like win probability. So just to to recap um, some avenues for, for future work here. I think as a whole um, in, in the in, in esports, um, you know, we focus on Counter-Strike because um, the data is there. But you know, the kind of work that we did, it we couldn't really do this in something like Call of Duty, for example, where the data just um, doesn't really exist. And there may be some interesting things, um, some cross-game learnings that that we may be able, may be able to derive. The second is that um, we can explore different ways to represent game states. So we just used a simple vector, but it's um, it's feasible to you know reformulate the problem as one of um, perhaps a game state could be a, a graph or maybe it's a set of the players. Um, we could also think of like a sequence based approach to predicting win probability. So there's lots of different avenues um, when it comes to predicting win probability itself. That we could actually explore. And lastly, um, there's still plenty of uh, interesting questions that uh, that arise from, from uh, what we do, particularly um, trying to investigate relationships like map geometry and how that affects the wind probabilities, um, because we do see such large discrepancies um, between maps. And lastly, I just I just want to um, include this little bit on, on how we parsed our actual data because um the infrastructure to support esports analytics can be kind of sparse at times and so we develop and maintain um, the opi library which allows you to parse and analyze and visualize um, csgo demo files um, and it's a python library if you'd like to install it this is you know how you would do it 
Um, it's called OPI because the OP is like a very important weapon in, in CSGO. And this is just a demo of what it looks like, you know, three lines and you can get this JSON output of player actions like kills, damages, and also frames, which are kind of like uh, the game states that we talked about. These are snapshots of the game at a moment in time. So uh, with all of that, uh, happy to, to take any questions um, and, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Peter. Um, so does anybody have questions to Peter? Um, again, you put it in the chat or you could raise your hand and, and ask your question directly. <clears throat> While we're waiting, Peter, um, you, you mentioned uh, trying to move it to other game environments. Um, if it were up to you, what game environments would you want to apply this to? I think that uh, because the structure of the FPS games are kind of similar from one to another, I think Valorant is kind of the, the most direct choice here, um, particularly, I think, because there are probably some things that are um, <laughs> quite similar between Valorant and, and, and uh, CSGO. Also, Valorant has such a large user base um, that I think win probability is, is very, very relevant there. And I know that uh, Riot has like uh, an API. It's just not really like as um, perhaps public as the CSGO data maybe. 